everybody and welcome to the Cinefix Top 100, our quest to eliminate all crime in old Detroit by the time we watch 100 of the greatest movies of all time. I'm Clint Gage, and with me as always, Cinefix's chief cyborg arm designer, Alex Stedman. How's it going, that Alex? me. Hello, hello. Yeah. Happy to be here. Talking more cyber. Cyborg. 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 We'll take either one. We might have time to cover both cyborgs and cybergs. Uh, but meanwhile, also the creep whose move it is. Michael Calibro. How's it going, man? Good, man. Who cares if it works? You know, we could get 30 years of parts contracts here. Exactly. <laughs> it's a temporary it's setback. All, all that really matters. I, for one, am real excited to talk about the movie that we're talking about today. So excited. I actually wore, I, I have a RoboCop t-shirt on. Not to, to spoiler alert. We're talking about RoboCop. Oh, uh, look at this. Dad wears his band t-shirt to the concert. Um, <laughs> I know it's not the coolest thing to do to wear the t-shirt of the band you're going to see to the concert, but I, it just, it was looking at me when I opened my, my t-shirt drawer today. So, uh, so here we are. We get the best of both worlds. The fastest reflexes modern technology has to offer onboard computer assisted memory and a lifetime of on the street law enforcement programming. It is my great pleasure to present to you. Robocop. Am I the only one that's this excited to talk about Robocop? Uh, no, I am ecstatic. <laughs> okay. My, my levels of excitement might be less than yours. However, I was happy to revisit it. I'm, I'm not not right. excited. Well, that's fine. That's all no. I ever ask of anybody is to not be not excited. Right. Anyway, let's get into it. Robocop. Okay, 1987, Paul Verhoeven. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call it a masterpiece. Uh, I don't want to be doing Bush that. there. I, yeah, I love this. <laughs> I adore this movie. It's starring Peter Weller as Officer Alex Murphy, who gets just shot up into hamburger meat uh, at the end of Act One of this movie in the violent dystopian streets of uh, Detroit, uh, only to be resurrected as a RoboCop. Uh, and I guess the, at that point, he goes on a journey to rediscover some of his humanity, more or less. I mean, yeah. what I love about this movie is like, Verhoeven often says it's like an allegory for like Jesus, you know, like the uh, the shotgun scenes, a, uh, you know, a crucifixion. And yeah. he makes the point that Robocop is walking over water before he shoots the dad from that 70s show in the end. <laughs> so it's like, like, you know, it's just thumbs up on, you know. The greatest religion star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then Paul Paul Verhoeven, up to and including his oh. most recent film, we'll, 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 just we'll constantly touch. doing, we'll touch doing on wonders one. with Christ imagery on film. So, getting, I mean, when was that? Alex? You mentioned that that you you kind of had to, to revisit this this movie again. It's not not one of your favorites of all time, but it's like. Not uh, yeah, it's you know, for as much as I do love cyborgs, we've established. Uh, no, it's not one of my favorites. I. First watched it kind of in this era of my early 20s where I was catching up on a lot of film and I kind of had this group of friends where, you know, every night would turn into, oh, you've never seen this, you've never seen that. And Robocop is one of those, oh, you've never seen that. Uh, a lot so of we gasping watched it. and clutching at pearls. Yeah, How yeah. dare Robocop. you have never oh, seen Robocop? A crime sure. on Verhoeven in this house. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but so I watched it then and I feel like while it might have been the ideal way to watch it for fun because it was just a bunch of drunk 20 somethings watching it in someone's shitty apartment. Um, I don't know if I fully appreciated the other things that I that it had to say until I rewatched it alone in my apartment uh, like 10 years later after having lived a lot more life and experienced more capitalism. Uh, so like I said, I'm happy to revisit it. I, I enjoy it more than I thought I did. Yeah, listen, this this movie taught me how to cuss. When I was a kid, so I am forever <laughs> indebted to this film, um, and it's just it's a, it's a blast every time I go back to it. But um, we've we've touched on Verhoeven a little bit, but the you know in terms of the pedigree of this movie, I, I think a lot of it has to do, and we run into this all uh, we've run into this bunch with, with some of the movies that we've already talked about. But a lot of it has to do with uh, I mean, there's the satirical element, but then there's also the the production and the the special effects kind of side of thing, which like where it's sort of the hardware part of its pedigree comes in. Like it did, uh, it got a nomination for, let's see, what did it, it won a special achievement award, a special achievement Academy award for sound, uh, nominated for best editing and best sound. It got a few BAFTA nominations as well, including one for special effects, but it ended up losing to our, our pals at who framed Roger rabbit, uh, which, you know, can't really argue with that. No. Um, 
but then it, awards wise, that's that's pretty much it. But the the this is another one where the roster of people that worked on this movie is is pretty incredible. There's there's Rob Botton, uh, whose work on the thing is just stupidly legendary. Uh, Phil Tippett is probably the biggest name. Here's here comes another yeah, another. I mean, Another plug for Mad God. If you haven't seen Mad God yeah. yet, go I mean, go get your Phil Tippett fix. It, it's kind of arguable who is bigger, Rob Bottin or Mad God or Phil Tippett. You know, like these guys are both at the top of their game. <laughs> yeah, and the the fact that they were working together, and it, even uh, Stephen Dupuis, who who we talked about on uh, on the Fly episode, he was on this yeah. this movie as well. Um, so there's a lot of really good behind the scenes talent working on this movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, when it comes to what holds up and what doesn't, there's a lot of stop motion that maybe looks, looks a little off. But and I'm sure we'll talk about this scene, the toxic waste scene at the end. Oh, oh we'll my talk about God, that. Scene. That holds up. That is terrifying. We will. That is a good long tease for that scene because we will yeah. uh, we, we're going to have to talk about that. But um, which, by the way, so this it came out in 87 just to run down some of the other movies that came out in 87 because we kind of we, we sometimes talk about like what you know the the great years for movies in 87 uh, like i need to nominate that to be part of the conversation but princess bride spaceballs full metal jacket running man wall street raising arizona dirty dancing lethal weapon monster squad beverly hills cop 2 predator lost boys uh there were some there were some bangers in 87 that's, that's a murderer's row for sure yeah we sh- I feel like that should be an episode at some point. We should start just doing movie years because that's a killer one. That, that, Ronnie, that lineup's nuts. Ronnie Cox has got two in there. He's got two of them. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's a hell of a year. Yeah, it's a good year for Ronnie Cox. Man. So I, I, I would argue, I having learned this information, I would argue that is the best year for Ronnie Cox. It's peak Ronnie Cox. Uh, okay. I don't think yeah. there's any competition for that. I think that's his year. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just go ahead and give it to him. Yeah. Yes. Ronnie Cox, champion of 1987. Yes. Congratulations, Ronnie. Yeah. But it was the start of quite the quite the few years for Verhoeven, too. Because after that, you had Total Recall in 90, Showgirls 95, Starship Troopers 97. I mean, he owned that era. Not completely. But, forgot about yeah. Basic Instinct. Basic oh Instinct was in there, too. Basic Instinct in 92. Yeah. Also a great year, 92. But, like, this is the beginning of Paul Verhoeven. Like, right? Like, he, direct, he directed a couple of movies, like, in Europe first. But then, like, here's the first time they got a budget. And, like, dude. He figured out the Paul Verhoeven formula in like round one of money. And like this has this is clearly the best Paul Verhoeven film, but everyone else, like Total Recall and Starship Troopers, they come really, really close. But nevertheless, it's all it's all, it's all here. I mean, the, those movies might be tied, honestly, for for first place. Like I oh, really? told Total Recall I will put in third place. And I think it's a coin flip between it depends on my mood, I think, honestly, between Robocop and Starship Troopers, I think, because oh, like I, I think they're both we'll, we'll talk more about the, the satire in both of these movies is so, so overwrought to the point where it's like, oh, my God, you're just incredible. making fun of us all. Like it's it's he's, the way it that he feels silly. about it. Yeah, it gets so silly, yeah. and, and we'll I, there's a there's a couple of moments uh, in particular that, that I flagged that, that kind of speak to that. But. The satire in this in this movie is is so good and so so heavy handed and on the nose that it becomes something else entirely. It becomes that, it's so stupid it becomes smart again, kind yeah, of, it, that, which isn't the case. But like that's that's sort of the that's sort of the effective kind of feel that that it first lands on you with, right? Yeah, I mean that's why I kind of I think I wrote it off initially. It, I compared it to almost kind of like a Trojan horse where it kind of rolls in in this kind of veil of silly satire and then the more you watch it you're like oh actually this is kind of smart i just actually have to watch it and think about it but yeah there is um not a lot of subtlety here which is why starship troopers grows on me every time i every time i watch it i think every yeah. time i watch it i'm like this is smarter than i thought it was last time see that's my favorite for hope well, my my verhoven ranking is very different than yours I mean, I, this, this is like three this one does me. it too though yeah yeah oh it does see, i'm sure I'm convinced that like um, this is the best like this is the best one of these for me. I think it's a coin flip between Total Recall and Starship Troopers. But what I do think is like the best part about Starship Troopers is like he like totally inverts the meaning of the novel. Like the novel is all about like civic duty and like doing your part for like the government 
the novel like, is more you know, or less like, a recruitment poster. Yeah, uh, but it's like, yeah, but this is and, quite the opposite. And oh god, it's so good, it's so good. I mean, it's true. There is no Starship Troopers without RoboCop. I mean, so many of those same themes yeah. pulled through. Yeah, yeah no, we'll, we'll Basic get... Instinct, the one, the one movie that I forgot. That's like my my second favorite for Hoven. Erotic it's thrillers. Yeah. Go erotic thrillers. We love this. Um, we do. We do. In this house, we support erotic thrillers. Um, you still do the yeah. erotic thriller game. He is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. he sure is. <laughs> right. I don't, he never. He never quit that. Um, but let's talk about. Uh, d- d- so it it made fifty three million dollars that year uh, on a, a somewhere. I saw eleven million, or I saw fifteen million somewhere in there. I think it was a little more expensive than whatever the numbers were, were reported on. So it did it did well, right? It wasn't I mean, like a runaway success, but it it did well. It merchandised well, that's for sure. Well, and it like, got sequels and remakes, and it's we're, yeah. you know we're still talking Frank, about it. So Frank Miller wrote the comic books and yeah. penned the sequel, which is just like you know outside the scope of maybe our discussion about RoboCop one. But nevertheless, it is like this. It's weird that fifty million dollars can generate this much runway for like sequels and just IP. Like, I don't know if today you can build the new IP off of a $50 million box office. I don't think off of $50 million, but maybe four times the budget. Yeah. Get well, you, get you that. But... For Robocop was it did so well on home sales. Like that's what I read. It had a hell of a home sale campaign. I remember seeing like when I was looking into this movie, seeing some kind of campaign in a blockbuster that was like this is protected by ocp i think that's where a lot of people discovered it not not the box office so you know lots of movies have new life once they once they leave the box office i did i did read a thing too that it was it had the longest waiting list to be rented on vhs uh that year see Um, it was doing which is like the fact that the fact that in the late 80s we were tracking that just makes me so happy like i just say we're remembering those and then also it was a 90 dollars vhs <laughs> well that was like when like, they were still shit. figuring out vhs tapes yeah right? like, yeah like it was what is the right, business model right here? on the right at that entry point of like how are we going to make money on vhs like i don't know charge 90 bucks for them um i also so. wonder how much of that was kids who couldn't see it in theaters because it was rated r and they're like no oh I'm plenty it. No. yeah Hot. plenty it was for me um, so i'd like i remember watching it at home so I don't think I saw it in the theaters. I was probably too too. I saw Die Hard two in the theaters, but I don't think I saw RoboCop. Did you see think RoboCop two in the theaters? Probably. I think that's the one they shot in Houston. So that yeah. was there was well, like a shot, little extra. They, they shot, shot this the first one in Dallas. Dallas, right? Yeah, yeah. Which I I like. This, I don't want to get. I don't want to. This will be our 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 teasing the tour section later. The dirtbag um, city of the future. The dirtbag city of the future. It's it's a little bit of where where you know Houston Dallas rivalry is concerned. I am happy to know that one of the reasons they decided to shoot in Dallas is that there were parts of the city that they could just blow up. <laughs> and is, they did. They just blew it they up. Did. <laughs> Which is a hilarious thing that I read. It's like yeah, we chose Dallas because they had some skyscrapers, but also there were parts of town we could just set bombs off in. Which I was like, yep, <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> All of that kind of speaks to uh, to Verhoeven and and what he th- what he thought was important about this movie too, because apparently he had to the budget being what it was, like he had to make some concessions. So picking a place, uh, you know, in Dallas that, you know, they didn't have it wasn't a union state, and like they they could blow up parts of town for on the cheap, and like apparently he had to choose between an expensive production designer and a good RoboCop costume. It's it's things like that that he he was like. Wisely. He knew what this movie was. And to your point, Cal, you already said it too. Like he, like nailing down the Verhoeven formula right out of the gate with him. Like he knew exactly what was important about this movie and put all of the resources in that direction, which I think is, is incredible. Yeah. And I don't want to blow too many dwarfs here, but it very uh, almost wasn't Verhoeven. Verhoeven was not super keen to take this script. He thought it was a B movie, uh, but his wife talked him into it. So listen to your wife, boys. Thank you, Mrs. Verhoeven. We should all be so lucky to have a Mrs. Verhoeven guiding our decision making like that. Robocop, who is he? What is he? Where does he come from? 
He is OCP's newest soldier in their revolutionary crime management program. OCP spokesmen claim that the fearless machine has crooks on the run in old Detroit. Today, kids at Lee Iacocca Elementary School got to meet in person what their parents only read about in comic books. Robo, excuse me, Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Ow. Stay out of trouble. Let's get into uh, to brilliant moments. The cable news. Let's just start the right cable at the news. beginning. Oh, right no. set, it sets the tone. It sets the sarcasm. Like everything that this movie is going to do is embodied right in those first couple of minutes. That's the one that I had on uh, top of my list to talk about too. Like the the it's so so wonderfully satirical and so and and like the the writing of it is is really sharp too because it's it includes things that in the eighties we were familiar with. There's a joke about Star Wars which was the Reagan era thing, you know, space defense thing. It was a very real thing. The, um, uh, you know, obviously the Cold War and, and countries becoming nuclear powers. And like, there was a, a joke about that. And they're, they're all just saying it with a grin on the evening news, you know. And, and then they cut to this bananas, like, heart transplant commercial. Uh, and then straight back to Omni Consumer Products Corporation privatizing the police force. And so it's like, they, they sneak it in with like goofy things about real concepts. So there's just enough truth in the bananas sort of satire that they're doing that by the time we start talking about a corporation creating a robotic cop, like we're, we're on board, we're ready to buy it and we know what, what we're doing here. It's, it was really skillfully done in the first, what, three and a half minutes. I mean, think about it, right? Like, so like to your point, right? That movie opens up with like, you know, like, well-to-do news anchors complaining about like civil rights activists. The space weapons thing is the only thing that I don't think particularly holds up because that just, you know, like never became a thing. But all that really is, is a vehicle to make fun of the president for falling, which is something we still do today. Right? Like, <laughs> happens, how, like, happens about every four years. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, like remember when Biden fell down the like the yeah. stairs of like Air Force One? So like that's a story, right? Then it cuts to like the new like then it cuts to like the movie commercials, which is all about privatized medicine and the fact that like, you know, there's financing available for your new heart. And then like, do they do the Nukem commercial here? Or do they do the Nukem commercial later? That's later. But the Nukem later. commercial is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a board game about you know thermonuclear war. Like it's yeah. cold, cold war. The board game. It's incredible. Yeah. And then it's and then it's to your point, right? It just goes right into Om like Omnicon, just buying the city. And it's just like, oh yeah, by the way, we're buying the city, and like we're into it. And it's I mean, it's it's such a great illustration of the slippery slope that leads to a corporation owning all of us. Yeah. And I will say because I think this is set in twenty thirty nine, right? Oh, I didn't. I don't even I don't think, think so. I, I, mean, I don't think it's I don't, that far ahead. I think it's just yeah. vaguely near future, which is frankly yeah, yeah. my favorite setting for science fiction. Yeah. Vaguely oh, yeah. near future is the best. Because you can really shoot yourself in the foot if you say like, "Oh, I'm setting my movie in 2030," and then it's don't 2030. Don't put a date and it, on it. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just need to be like, you just need to be like plausibly attainable with within yeah. the next like decade or so, and it can be whenever. You know. Yeah, but I will say, as far as like now that we're watching this movie so many years later, I'm like, you know what? It's not so far fetched. None of it. <laughs> this no. Well, that's a great. Th gotta... That's the great thing about not putting a date to it, right? Is yeah. like this could all happen tomorrow. At whenever you watch this movie, like this could happen tomorrow. Outside of you know the you know the, the tube TVs that everybody's still watching, but you, if you can look past that, like thematically, this movie is is never going to not be relevant. Yeah, I mean, I feel like so many movies go for the hoverboard approach, where it's like, oh, we'll all be flying and. Do no, this movie's just like, actually, everything will be privatized and corporations will own us. And it's like, oh, that actually goes very well in 2023. Yep. And they're going to, uh, to uh, you know, enact a plot to to make part of your city's so crime ridden that they can buy them up cheap and put a new development in. And like, yeah. The Reagan 80s, yeah. man. <laughs> the Reagan, the Reagan 80s. Wild um, times. <laughs> he was, it was great back then, guys. You have no idea. They produce um, some of our best dystopian sci-fi. You know, like they live is making the same kind of commentary as this. It's, it's true. And the Running Man, the Running Man too is one of my favorites. From the, this was a that was one that I rattled off from the the list of eighty seven bangers. Right, like I'll put the you know in the lineup of nineteen the Murderers Row of of eighty seven movies. I'll put I'll put the Running Man on the bench, but I don't know that it's in my starting lineup. But um, it's great. 
It's and it's another one of those like, yeah, this is probably all going to happen. Like we're constantly just just like what four bad decisions away from the Running Man actually being on TV. And I will Something say, like that. Or, Running Man or a writer strike. Or a writer strike. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of union talk in this movie too. That I, I just because of the moment we're living in really struck me. Yeah, that's, that's the the whole talk about the cops going on strike. And, yeah. You know, well, you can't go on strike. We owe it to you know. Which it was weird because I feel like the film sincerely believed that. Also. Well, oh, yeah. you know, you know that that's a hold on. When was the Reagan? When did Reagan fire all the air traffic controllers? Ooh, I don't know. You look that up. I'm looking that up. We'll continue talking, but like the the way that that the, the police captain was ranting against unions and against like you can't don't even talk about unionizing you know we owe it to the people here to protect them and like him taking the job of a police officer the civic duty of a police officer seriously felt felt like the stance of the movie the movie didn't feel like it was taking a pro union stance or even in like i i don't know it was i guess it, it mostly it was just like it it's a hard it's an impossible place to be for everybody. I don't know if it's pro-union. It's very anti-corporate. So if you look at anti-corporate as pro, pro-union, you could look at it that way. Um, no, but I think the line he says like really early on is just straight up like, cops don't strike. And you really think- What are we, just, plumbers? What are we, pl- yeah, yeah, that's what it is. So the Reagan thing happened in, ni- the Ra- when Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers, that happened in 1981. And- I like that whole concept. Like they cut away to that one guy. He's like, what do you mean they strike? They're civil servants. Like they have job security. Like what are they fighting for? Like that was kind of like the rhetoric. Like that was come of like kind of like the more conservative anti-union rhetoric back then. And I think like incorporating it in there is great, especially since like these cops are you leveraging their union to fight against a corporation that is trying to like overtake the uh, like overtake, like overtake the city's like civil service, civil servants. And city and like city services it's nuts i i personally land on the thing that i think it is very pro-union and i agree with you that like it's an overarching anti-capitalist message but like nevertheless like all they could do is stop their labor in order to stop like omnicorp from trying to like take over the city like that's all they have left yeah is i mean i guess too it was you know that that thread was just kind of floating in the background like it was a yeah. subplot but it wasn't it wasn't a terribly vital one i guess no, I, I but, would agree. Uh, but either that. either way, yeah. I mean, the the anti corporation uh, is is super front and center, yeah. um, and the the union part of it is is kind of off to the side. But yeah, it's I, I, either way. I mean, like the the satire and the and the the social relevance of RoboCop is the thing that always gets forgotten. You know, like I mean, that's the that's the danger with Paul Verhoeven stuff, right? It's so pulpy and goopy and bloody, and it's action stuff, and everybody like. You know, I mean, lines like "bitches leave." You know, it's, it's my like favorite stuff line like movie. that. <laughs> stuff like that is so on the nose and so heavy-handed, and he paints with such a broad bro- brush. If you stand back and look at, it. but like, if you actually, you know, you got to look a little bit closer. And it's so it it's so smart. It's so smart. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think it took me a while to appreciate it. I mean, back when I first watched it, I wasn't thinking about any of this. I was a stupid like 21 year old not really well some of it um no but i i think that's why a lot of people including myself wrote it off at first because yeah it is silly goopiness um but gosh and it's, it's called really, robocop it's called also, robocop is, and guess what it's about <laughs> it's about a robot cop <laughs> it's not about yeah, a robot it's great uh no it's about it's a it's a scathing takedown of reagan's america in the late 80s it's what it's about and it's about a robot cop red alert red alert Red alert. You crossed my line of debt. You haven't dismantled your MX stockpile. Pakistan is threatening my border. That's it, Buster. No more military aid. <laughs> Nuke them. Get them before they get you. Another quality home game from Butler Brothers. I wouldn't mind moving on to meeting Ed 209. Yep. That's that was my next one we're too. To, I love that scene. To move move into that sequence. Let's, yep. I love this sequence, but I only have one thing I want to actually say about it, which is like the length of the squib. I think like this is the first time when you get the the satire of the violence, right? And I think like like 
Ed for Ed one Oh nine is like just shooting him for like 15 to 20 seconds. Like it just doesn't stop. Like it, it keeps on cutting back and forth and like they reset the squibs and then cut back. And it's like, it takes so long to the point. Like if it was any kind of short, if it was any shorter, it would actually be violent and have the unintended consequence of being horrifying where this just goes on so long that you're like, he, this is still happening. And that's what kind of makes it. That's like, that's like the subversive humor and the violence in this movie. And this is like the first time that you see it. And I think that like same kind of like this violent act is still happening. Also echoes in the, in the, like the shotgun scene where they're, where they're, where they're shooting, where they're shooting Murphy. And I, I think that, I just think that that like extent, those extended sequences of violence are very well-timed and like, it's weird to think of having good comedic timing in something like so uh, horrifically violent, but it's Grisly in that, death. Yeah. Yeah. But it's in that timing and knowing that you just need to let it like extend that long is, is honestly one of the films like small strokes of brilliance. Well, like you said, it's the first time you get that violence and it's not where you expect to get that violence. I mean, yes, the Murphy death scene was in kind of this like grungy warehouse, but we're in the middle of a corporate office and he just gave a uh, Dick Jones just gave a big speech about uh, privatization and all of a sudden this clean office becomes an absolute war zone <laughs> and like you said it goes on so long um but i think what really struck me about this scene is how indifferent so many of the uh corporate workers were i mean i think in particular the old man kind of just like puts his head in his hand and is just thinking about it in terms of like you just wasted so much money and we're probably gonna get sued because we just killed this poor man <laughs> but no it's it's really introduces you to not only like the big themes as far as corporations and privatization go but yeah it's where the the very over the top violence starts because up until then we'd gotten plenty of the we gotten the news broadcast stuff we've we've seen some of the interaction like at on the ground at the police station and and we've we've been introduced to what kind of satire this movie is going to be but yeah until they just blow away this dude with just the goopiest squibs and this is where <laughs> i will put I'll, I'll give total recall points or over the robo like what you know learning to 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 crawl with squibs uh in in uh, so they could run robocop so that they could like, sprint with them in total recall i think um just sprint just, up an escalator just goopy <laughs> just liquid full on it's it, the squibs are incredible in in this movie and in that scene too and like i can imagine sitting there watching it and you don't really like, oh man, this guy's in trouble. And then all of a sudden he's just getting blown away for way too long. And to the point where you're <laughs> laughing at how how much he's getting shot, which is a bizarre place to be. And then yeah, uh, the I, I I agree with you, Alex. I think the I think the most telling part about this this scene in general though, like there's the the brilliance of all of the squibs for as long as it was. But the most telling part is yeah, the indifference. And it's like these people do not care about human life. Like the old man is off there to the side being like, I'm really disappointed in you, Dick Jones, for kind of screwing up this project. Uh, and that's what I'm mad about here. Not that there's a, a man that's been murdered by a, by a rogue piece of, you know, tech in my office. Dick, I'm very disappointed. I'm sure it's only a glitch, a temporary setback. You call this a glitch? We're scheduled to begin construction in six months. Your temporary setback could cost us $50 million in interest payments alone. It might be the most important early scene in this movie. Like I in think, terms I of, think in terms neck of setting Neck and neck with up. Murphy's, yeah. And I yeah, think with yeah. t two, it, it, like you were saying, it, it goes on for almost comically long. And the other thing that really unfortunately made me laugh in this scene was I believe the line after he's been shot for, like we said, about 30 seconds. Someone says, someone call a goddamn paramedic. Yeah. It's like, I think he's, I think he's out. I think he's thoroughly well, gone. And that's, I, I do also want to mention the, the, how blissfully kind of detached everybody is in that boardroom. Like some of those characters, there's Bob, there's, um, uh, Miguel Ferrer's character, uh, Bob Morton, I think is his name. And then his two little cronies that are the younger generation that they're going to, you know, they're going to go over Dick Jones's head straight to the old man and all that stuff. And, um, but the way that those guys are just grinning idiots the whole time and that are completely, you know, unequipped to deal with any of this stuff. 
is hilarious. <laughs> like these these people are they're just a bunch of bunch of stooges wandering around going like, oh man, I hope he doesn't shoot me next. Like that's that's really all it is, you know. Probably my bit player of the movie, and this is the first scene where he uh, makes a great expression is Felton Perry as OCP employee Donald Johnson. Uh, he is not an important character. He just appears throughout, but he always just has the silliest facial <laughs> expressions. Yeah. And this scene is one of them where he's kind of just, uh oh, what's this? Well, that's that's another part about Verhoeven that that's always, you know, it's always the trick with him. It's like that sort of performance is so like it's easy to to just be like, well, that's bad. That's just bad acting. Gotta look at how bad that guy's acting. But it's like, no, it's it's all part and of it. It's not a it's not a yeah. <laughs> It's not a, it's not a glitch. It's a feature. Like it's, yeah. you know, like it, that, that kind of thing all, it all adds up to like, this is this world that we're looking at is bizarre and it's not too different from ours. Like that's, that's satire. And that's why it's so great. It's even little guys like that. Also from a technical perspective of this, right? Like the stop motion animation in front of the live action, right? So it's like the rear projected people freaking out in the background as like Phil Tippett is animating this. This is not the moment I want to like really highlight Phil Tippett's uh, stop motion. I want to do that later in the showdown between uh, Ed 109 and RoboCop. But like still like this just comes in and it's just like this is this guy's first time doing this. And he's just like working with like Phil Tippett, Rob, Rob Botin, like like to do these scenes that are so technically complex and what we're sitting here doing is talking about how long he let the swib, squibs go as the moment of genius. But then there's this like technical foundation of work that is just, you know, underlying all of this. The guy that made Imperial Walkers scary is also working on Ed 209. And like the because I, I did listen to a, a, a thing where Phil Tippett was talking about the scene and the way that, yeah, the, the shooting when they shot the plates that were the rear projection for his, I mean, cause he did it this, the same way, you know, Ariausen did it and Jason and the Argonauts and all that stuff. Like, um, cause he shot it on, they shot the plates of the actors first that he would then rear project and shoot through with like mats and you know, all, all kinds of stuff like that. But the oldest school trick that there is as far as that goes. Um, but then <laughs> apparently Verhoeven was directing the, the, oh, the plates and he was standing in front of the life-size model of Ed 209 and like acting as Ed 209 and getting everybody to react to him. Like, ah, he was like screaming at everybody. And that's, that's what everybody was reacting to in the plates of actual Ed 209 was Paul Verhoeven, which I, I think is just, cause you also hear, yeah, that, that guy, that guy was not, not afraid to get his hands dirty for the, for the art. That makes the expressions on all the employees faces uh, a lot better. I think with yeah. that context. Yeah flopping the body onto the model of the town that they're about to build like literally spilling blood onto what will become their plans for new detroit i think I also didn't like put that together but yeah I that is know, very you know on, on the nose there's a, there's a very real chance that it was just the table that was there that he could flop on and that's what looked the best but also like i'm, I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt to verhoven about doing doing that on purpose but just like splattering all that all that wonderful goopy blood onto the their vision for the new new city is uh i think pretty pretty sharp <laughs> that poor janitor at that corporate office it kind of building off of this scene the the movie did actually had, like it had an X rating for a minute. It, it, well, it didn't actually get one. It was the MPAA. I, I don't, I'm, am I torfing too soon, by the way? No, that's not um, my torf. Torf away. Oh, great. So the MPAA uh, kept wanting to give it an X rating. And so they had to rework it eight or 10 or something like that times to where it was finally like the 11th time um, that they submitted it to the MPAA that they actually got the R rating, uh, which scenes like this and were part of what they had to kind of dial back a little bit to make sure that they got the R rating instead of the X. But uh, apparently some of the news broadcast stuff that that shows up in the middle of the movie was placed just so that they could kind of lighten the mood a bit in spots uh, so that they could get away from that X rating and get the, get the R rating as well, But which I thought was interesting. But this was one of the scenes that was flagged as being like, oh God, holy shit, this is X. Huh. I would like to see that. I don't know if I would actually like to see it, but I wonder if that X-rated version is out there. I think this is it. <laughs> this is probably it. Yeah, we might have we might have watched. If it. you're watching, if you're watching the director's cut, I'm assuming that is as close. Oh to it yeah. Because this is the un like the unrated direct. You know? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And the way those the way that horse trading works, though, with the MPA is is kind of fascinating because like it's probably, you know, there were three. What's like? Well, maybe if you cut away, you know, if you cut to the squibs four times instead of five, maybe we'll maybe that'll be R. And it's it's stuff like that. That's like the tiny little minutia that that they sort of have to debate. Oh, it's the same um, thing to do with swears. Like you get one f bomb, and you're able to keep. Yeah, 13. it's it's a decently arbitrary thing, and sometimes sometimes they'll even be like. And I think this is probably what they had uh, had to move some of the the broadcast of the commercials and the news and uh, and those sort of things to kind of lighten the mood a little bit. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Sometimes it's just like a I don't know. The whole thing just feels like it's an X rated movie, and there's no like concrete note that they give you. It's like oh, that's the one shot that makes it X rated instead of R or anything, which is arbitrary and silly and it depends on who's watching it you know but whatever they the mpa has got a good little racket going so who who am i to argue with them i just like that it sets up one of my low-key favorite parts of the movie which is this kind of like corporate uh battle between bob dick and old man kind of in the background a little bit um but you really get the idea i think immediately that at one point dick was bob and he bobbed someone out and Bob is trying to become Dick. Um, and you also just get the idea that they're both terrible people. And this really sets, sets the stage for that. But that that's all I think on that scene. Yeah, Bob swooping in and sort of like, oh, I, I've got a RoboCop program that can be ready to go in 90 days. It's just like. Right. It's just like, oh, you are you just witnessed the most gruesome death you could have witnessed. And you're like, oh, but yeah. what about this? And they're high-fiving on the way out of the room about it, too. Oh, yeah, like, that's the funny fine. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, no one needs to decompress after that. Yeah. He and your your facial expressions guy are just like, yeah, that's how you do it, man. I, um, love, I don't love them. Such bros. Perhaps you're aware of the RoboCop program developed by myself at Security Concepts as a contingency against just this sort of thing. Thank you for your concern, Mr. Morton. I'm sure this is something no, we can take up in my office at a moment. <laughs> Maybe what we need here is a fresh perspective. Tell me about your plan, Mr. Morton. How long will it take? We're ready to go, sir. We've restructured the police department and placed prime candidates according to risk factor. I'm confident that we can go to prototype within 90 days. Good, very good. Get your staff together, Mr. Morton. I'll expect a full presentation in 20 minutes. Thank you, sir. What's the next thing on your list? Got me Murphy's death, right? Well, you get in between that, you get the whole introduction to him and Lewis. Um, they go into this warehouse that I mentioned. Lewis gets separated and tricked because that one guy was peeing and was smart about it, uh, which actually made me a little mad because I was like, come on, you're, you're better than this, Lewis. Yeah, and she is. She is. She's, um, she redeems herself. But in that moment, it's like, oh, come on. But yeah, no, the, the, the hilarious you know, Christ imagery by way of Verhoeven of him getting his hand just shot and just the, just a hose of blood. I think everything we said about Ed 109 just like totally applies here too. It's just like, just copious, copious squibbing and just like overdoing it. And it's, it's so good. <laughs> worse than the previous scene because they just draw it out for so long because like you said first his hand goes and then they shoot off his arm and then they shoot his torso for however long and then they, yeah they, yeah it never he's still ends. alive like he's the still fact alive that he's screaming yeah the fact that he's still he's our hero and he's still alive and screaming and there's no like literally a room full of people wielding shotguns run out of ammo shooting him and and he's still like ah you know on the it, it, it's so absurd the the links to which they shoot this guy uh and for him to still be around long enough to get shot in the head and still not die is also absurd and, and like yeah it's it's so nuts that it's like you have to be working on some something else here paul like what what point are you making with this well, it's like we've been saying, it is very Christ-like. Like he is even like kind of standing with his, well, one arm out. Um, and instead of a crowd around him, he just has a bunch of cackling villains. And the cackles make it even worse because he's like, again, the, just the sound design of this scene is just like, Ugh. but it's also kind of so over the top that it's not that disturbing in a way. Good night, sweet prince. <laughs> 
Hey, wait up, wait up, wait up. <laughs> and I guess we can talk to you about, this is as good a spot as any, to talk about Kurt Wood Smith. Dad from that 70s show as Clarence Boddicker. <laughs> and how it's one of my favorite villain performances of all time. Like, oh, it's great. He is, he's, he's insane. Like yeah. he's, it'd be just so big. And can you fly buddy? Like yeah, before he throws one of his own guys out the back of a car onto their windshield and like the lines, he is just, I mean, he's, he's a wild animal in this, in this movie. And, and there's no real rhyme or reason to it other than like, I feel like the direction that he got was like, just be 10% bigger than you think, man. Go ahead. And that was that was pretty much it, you know. Like, there's no. He's just like there's. He's he's a, a psycho, and that's it. Full stop. He's a psycho, and he loves killing people. Um, and then be be louder. Could you do that one more time? Just just louder. Can you fly, Bobby? Clarence, no. Hit it. No. Kerwood Smith, but they, they cast a good, they cast like um, a good murder of psychos on this, right? So like, <laughs> like Kurtwood Smith is a awesome, but uh, Paul McCrane as Emil, he is incredible. He also like is going to be, we're going to talk later about like, you know, like the, um, the melting scene. Melting man. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like he's great. And real early Ray Wise, you know, free, like pre Twin Peaks. You want to talk about a man that could go ham as be a, a being fucking psycho like it's him too so like all of these guys are just running the drug trade in detroit and even what's his name the guy that was the guy that was peeing like the way his cackle his like hyenas laugh is is so perfect it's like it's they they were all just they were all just having a blast i also read that apparently they were the group that um peter weller hung out with most on set <laughs> like I they were all, they were all good friends. Apparently, like I bet the group um, of actors is a fun, a lot of fun to hang out with when they're not. I, yeah, would, being... I would love to be on that group text. That would be great. I do like the juxtaposition of the two main villains, which is of course Dick Jones and Clarence. I mean, they're both just complete remorseless psychos in different fonts. One is in a corporate office, and one is shooting someone in a warehouse. But neither of them have any humanity. No, I mean it's all the all the flavors of of corruption that you can get yeah. right there's the the you know corporate backed white collar crime kind of corruption that is sort of you know ac accepted part of the society versus the you know uh the insane boots on the ground psychopath i mean they're the same you know he even later when clarence actually shows up to the office and he's in like a suit or whatever he looks like he belongs there as much as any of the other people too which is like they're the same people yeah like the one is just wielding a corporation and the other one has you know a bunch of guys with uzis or like you know high-tech future rifles there's so many lines that i feel like we have to highlight throughout this movie and one of my favorites is you probably don't think i'm a very nice guy do you and i think you're slime buddy like <laughs> i just yeah. loved that line <laughs> it, it is not an overwritten movie no, <laughs> like I you even get what you and, get. <laughs> and I'm going to throw one more tease in for the melting man before we talk about it. But after after he splats all over the windshield, the line is shit. <laughs> like it's just everything is so just comically understated with like oh no. And <laughs> there's all there's also the real good like you know like thematically satirical line in this too right where it's just like when they're talking it's like why do we why do we rob banks but never get to keep the money and it's like takes money to make money we steal money to buy coke and sell the coke to make even more money capital investment man and he's just like but why bother making it when we could just steal it and then this, you know this line sums it all up which is no better way to steal money than free enterprise <laughs> i yeah and again, yeah. not subtle, just not really telling you what you're getting. No. <laughs> not not subtle, off. but like plainly smart. Like yeah. it's yeah. a clever, that's a clever line. It's not um, wrong. Can I really quickly flag the shootout in the cocaine factory? <laughs> the shootout <laughs> like, in the cocaine factory. The, I, there is <laughs> like, there, there, there's a, there's a cynical thing about this movie that it's like, that what is, what is more eighties than a shootout at a cocaine factory? And the answer is not much. You know, maybe a shootout in a cocaine factory in uh, a satire that's that's taking down corporate greed, which we also have here. 
But like the fact that like two bullets into this shootout, there's the room is just filled with this cloud of cocaine. And everybody's just wandering around through a cloud of cocaine, just blowing each other away. And that, it, but it's, I don't know, it's it's just awesome. Like there's like on on its surface, don't dig into it even a little bit, but like something like, it's so funny. This is a, ro a robot cop in a shootout at a cocaine factory is what we're dealing with here. And it's like, it's that sort of imagery that Verhoeven is just like shoving at you the whole time. And it's brilliant. It is absurd and it is brilliant. Shootout at the cocaine factory is a good name for an album. Yeah. Yeah. As soon <laughs> yeah. as we get our band going, let's, let's, let's just shoot. That'll, that'll be our first EP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, but I one thing that j did make me laugh is I was like, oh, I think he's maybe wrong about how prominent cocaine will be in the distant future. Uh, but it's part of the charm. There's so many that's in one of the sequels. Didn't they do like nuke or whatever? What was the drug in RoboCop three? I think is what it was. Forget. They were they went they went full future drugs at some point in the franchise. Okay. <laughs> they learned. They were like, okay, cocaine. Yeah, on they, the they took that note. <laughs> how about ED two hundred nine falling down the stairs? So that I think is like. That is Phil Tippett's particular mark of brilliance, right? So if like you like if you look at that first scene, right? Like that's the first scene is the anim is like the stop motion animation of that is very clearly like you know the ATSTs and the ATATs. But this this scene where he's it's like an animal, right? Like he's trying to step down. Like it's it's exactly like a dog trying to walk down the stairs, like a puppy trying to walk down the stairs for the first time and it can't quite get its footing. And you're like. This is the scene animated by the guy who an who had to animate the death of the Rancor in like the la or in the uh, Return of the Return Jedi. of the Jedi, yeah. And like you know, it's just like it's like at that point, it's like Ed One Hundred Nine is just like that sad puppy who just kind of like falls down the stairs and like a turtle on its back can't get back up. And it's it's really interesting how like animalistic that is compared to the uh, rigidity and um, you know measured movements of ed 109 in the beginning of the film and i just think like that juxtaposition is just like that's all phil tippett yeah and it's so good well that's a good point yeah. too because i like to your sad puppy uh point i almost kind of felt like bad for the yeah. <laughs> for the ed 209 when he was trying for to the guy go to yeah i felt bad yeah. for the yeah. guy yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was like, oh, you can do it. You can, you can go down those stairs, buddy. But yeah, it, it is a very oddly, I don't, charming is not the right word. Well, maybe it is. It's an oddly charming moment where there shouldn't well, be one. It's, it's a humanizing thing too, right? Because there's one thing that, that, you know, Robocop himself never grunts or, or has any sort of audible pain, right? Like he's getting shot up and he just kind of, you know, whatever. But then as soon as ed 209 falls down the stairs you get this like <laughs> he's like screeching and, and it seems like he's panicked and he's in distress and like and i'm referring to him as he right now like it's it it's a robot like but but ed, that's the kind of personality that you can sort of project onto it when it's falling down the stairs oh i thought it's it sounded like a baby crying i was a, like oh someone comfort him it, it's such a <laughs> stupidly simple foil for this robot it's like I mean, his, his arch enemy stares yeah, but it's so it's so disturbingly accurate, right? So like, not only am I watching that thing, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, wow, Phil Tippett's such a such a great animator. Like, it looks so good. He's like instilling humanity into this like robot because you feel so bad because he can't get out get on the Then I just start thinking about like, oh man, you remember that Boston Dynamics video where like the guy <laughs> is just kicking the robot and you just feel bad for the robot? I'm just like, oh, my God, this is so real. This is this is just thirty years ahead of its time. Like. It's like this is a Boston Dynamics creature right now. It's it's disturbing how accurate this is. Yeah. Well, there's a, those first couple of shots of it sort of like testing this. This he puts his foot out there and like there's nothing there. He's like what? Huh? And then he just tumbles like. <laughs> it's so funny. But it's also but realistic too because I feel like that's what a robot would like or like some kind of manufacturer would overlook. It's like what do you do about stairs? Well, Same we thing. Know, with, yeah. Roombas can't do now. it. Yeah. yeah, we know that now. You literally look at any of those like old Boston Dynamics video, like those Boston Dynamics videos of like those like those robots. Spot, I think it's called something like that. It looks exactly like this. It's it's creepy. Uh, while it's we're weird. on the ED two hundred nine, the ED two hundred nine uh, segment though, did you guys ever see that clip from the eighty eight Oscars with ED two hundred nine? Well, he like rescues Pee Wee Herman or whatever. Yeah, it's very yeah. silly and stupid, but I would highly recommend looking it up because I just found it so funny. <laughs> yeah. There, there is something too that's 
you know, and, and again, this is one of those situations, like how much credit do you want to give this, this movie and the thought behind any given little detail. But the fact that so much of this movie is about, you know, Murphy sort of finding his humanity again after he becomes RoboCop to where one of the juxtapositions between him and Ed 209, like the other option that OCP is looking at is, is something as simple as a person can walk downstairs and a robot cannot. Like, and so there's, there's something in that that's a little bit of a foreshadowing for Murphy's going to find his way through this. Whereas Ed 209 is just not a viable option at all. Um, there's no humanity left or present, even in fact, even if he is screaming like a, a, you know, an injured puppy or something like that, once he hits the ground, like, uh, but the whole, the whole deal, like it's, it's a weirdly, if you want to give this movie all the credit in the world, which I do. I'm wearing the t-shirt. It's a thematically on point bit of hilarity. It's funny. It's just funny. And it works with the story because Ed 209 can't walk downstairs. Well, I'll buy so, that and, for a dollar. Exactly. <laughs> I buy that. For, uh, we no, are, have we mentioned that, him yet? I don't think we have. We mentioned go, well, go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish uh, that up. No, we'll I was going to say like it, to talk about how much this movie holds up. I mean, I didn't even really think about the whole fact that you know a robot can't w- walk downstairs, but a human can. It's the same conversations that you have with AI these days. It's like, yeah, sure, an AI looks like it can do cool stuff, but there's a lot of humanity that you're missing there. So again, holds up. Holds right up. The I'd buy that for a dollar guy. Incredible. Ha- it's just so good. This is one of those things that I, I remember hearing somebody say, I'd buy that for a dollar. And then when I finally saw RoboCop, I was like, oh, that's what that's from. Do you think that that's the f- most famous quote from the movie? From a certain point of view, yeah. If you put the kind of mustard that that guy puts on that and set it around people, they'll know what you're talking about. They'll know exactly what movie you're talking about. Yeah, it's not yeah. my favorite. My say, favorite is Leave, bitches, but it is good. Bitches leave, yeah. No, the oh, bitches um, leave, yeah. <laughs> the uh, and your move, creep, is you know somebody's bound to think that's Dirty Harry, um, but uh, yeah, it might be. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the Melting Man. Liz, we've teased it several times now. Let's get into the Melting Man. This was Rob Bottin's whole thing. Like, well, this uh, is the RoboCop costume. <laughs> no, that was a different guy. That was, was uh, yeah, yeah. That was Tippett, and Tippett had another guy working with him. Chris Hayes, I think is what his name is. Okay. Did he do, he might have just done the, um, he actually might have just done the full-size model. I don't know. I, I I get the feeling that they were all working under the same trailer. Um, For sure. That's what I want to believe anyway. So, according to the RoboCop archive, it it was designed by OT. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's that's where I got my information about the Melting Man too. So I I can't I got to trust it for all of the things if I'm going to trust it for one thing. So <laughs> point is, this guy Emil trying to run over RoboCop with a van drives into a vat of toxic waste <laughs> just which not again not subtle <laughs> cocaine we were back at the cocaine factory in a lot of ways um which is the fact that he drives a van just through a giant vat of of a, a thing labeled toxic waste drives the van directly through it and it's still full of to- this abandoned warehouse that tank is still full of toxic waste apparently that Where else is he going to put it? Rushes him, rushes him straight <laughs> out of the back of the van, and immediately he starts to melt. What I really like about that too, and maybe I don't know if you could call it a lamp bump, uh, but you see it, you see the process of it. Like you see it wash over him, and you kind of see it at the back of his head. It starts, and it's kind of almost pulling away the skin a little bit. So they could have just had it wash over him. He pops up. He's now essentially deformed. Uh, no, but you have to sit there and watch it, and I. Like, I felt bad for the guy. Yes, he's a terrible, terrible person. But it, as a human, you're like, oh, my God, <laughs> that's like the worst possible way to go. And again, they draw it out like they draw out all the shootings. They really like make it they make you feel it. Yeah. And he, he wanders around for a little while and then he comes across um, uh, he comes across our, our, our guy, Ray, um, that <laughs> he's just like, what? You never get away from me. Um 
It's incredible. So it, apparently Botin did it in, he did do it in like a couple of phases. Like he, he sort of grad, he graduated the, the melting and he had a couple of different makeup looks. Um, the, my favorite part about it is, so when he gets splatted, he, the, um, this is another, one of my favorite lines is, is when Boddicker runs him over and just goes, shit. <laughs> um, but so he runs him over and he's, he's just completely liquefied at that point. And you can see the head kind of roll over the, the car, which apparently was an accident. Like they had a dummy set up to hit with the car and the head was loose, but it was a total stroke of luck that they actually saw it tumble like across the car. But when they cut back to inside the car and you see all of the goop splash across the windshield, apparently this was stuff that was made out of leftovers from catering. They, they just, <laughs> just whatever the caterer had left over, they put it in what they called it Emile's pot. They just kept a pot off to the side and they put all, like soup and chili and like whatever else in say, there. What they are just, they eating? Just drink they, like, just lasagna? All yeah, the yeah. Just lasagna all the time. Uh, but it was all, um, they called it a meal's pot and they just put, put old food in there and left it for days. And then they put it into water balloons and they chucked the water balloons at the window <laughs> and they just splattered across the window. And that's how, that's how they got, that was the melting man's insides getting splattered by a car was just rotten food and water balloons. I think it would be a lot of fun to work on RoboCop somehow. I feel like that was a real silly set. It was, it was the same. Yeah. I bet it was fun. Honestly, I bet everybody's yeah. having a blast, but it was the same, um, a similar approach to what they did in scanners. When the head blows up in scanners, like half of that is like old burgers that, that yeah. they didn't eat yesterday and stuff like that, which is, you know, old ways are the best ways, you know, just, just put some bad food and leave it out in the sun for three days and we'll figure something out. Put it in water balloons. <laughs> and, and put I mean it in water balloons. It kind of makes sense, though. It look, it just is a big hodgepodge of gross stuff flying everywhere. Yeah. It doesn't need to be that well thought out. It just simple. looks awful. That's the only it thing it gross. needs to be. Yeah. And it was. Ah! <laughs> Shit. We're we're to the end now, and I mean, we we saw him take his take his helmet off. His his makeup when he takes the helmet off is is just it's really cool. High evolutionary owes it a lot of. Uh, very much so. A lot. Did have the line that made me think the most. It was when uh, they were talking about his wife and child. And Lewis tells him that she started a new life and moved away. At, which also is like, wow, we've been here a while. Like, I didn't realize how long uh, of time period this t uh, movie takes place over. Uh, but he has this line that's, uh, I can't remember them, but I can feel them. It's like, that got weirdly existential. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, it really made me think. Yeah, it's like the data isn't there, but, uh, you know, the feeling is, the, yeah. which is a, a distinctly human thing. Maybe that's the Yeah, I don't want to give difference. it too much credit, but, like, some of the existential... Oh, come on. That's what we're here for. Give it some of the white I, I don't know why we're not giving this movie all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just didn't expect it to get that deep in terms of, like, what does it mean to have a soul? It's not yeah. something that I... When I first watched it in the environment that I did, it's not something that I thought about. But I was like, no, those oh, what would happen to your soul Those are the scenes you forget about, right? Like, the, yeah. the scene where he's walking through his old house and having those those flashbacks. And, like, those are scenes that you kind of forget about um, when you think about the movie. But, like, they're, they're, they're in they there. Matter. They're just yeah. as important. Yeah, they, they really matter. Oh, the uh, other funny thing that I read about, uh, speaking of just cruising right past those scenes, um, going back to the, uh, uh, the melting man thing, apparently that was one of the other scenes that the MPA wanted them to cut because to, to make the rating, but at the test screenings, people would write, what was your favorite part about the movie? And they're like, oh, when that dude got splatted by the car. <laughs> uh, so the melting man was one of the most popular parts of the, uh, of the, the test screenings. Um, apparently it, it also, and they left this part out of their argument with the MPA and that, that was kind of the turning point where they kind of started to draw the line with the MPA. We are like, you're, you're going to take everybody's favorite part of the movie out. Like that's insane. But apparently also the melting man was one of the, uh, the part that rated as like, uh, grossest. Like people would, the, the other question was like, what was your least favorite part? And a lot of people also put the melting man, <laughs> which they just kind of like <laughs> left out. So well, it was a absolutely... polarizing deal, but like very memorable. 
So it's a it's a high bar to be the grossest scene in this movie, but that is a hundred percent the grossest scene. And I t- totally believe it was the most popular because we brought it up like seven times before we actually talked about it. You can't not think about it. It's actually one of the few scenes that I specifically really remembered for my first watch. I forgot so much else, but it's like, oh no, like it just sticks with you. It's so terrible. And it, again, holds up really well. Those practical effects just hold up. Well, and, and that's the thing too about, you know, it, you know, maybe this is, this is the way to come down on RoboCop is like it, it proper, it's, it's just proper science fiction. You know, like there, there's, it's got, it's got that near future stuff. Uh, it's, it's projecting present day situations onto future scenarios. Um, it's dealing, grappling with things like what it means to be human and what it means to, you know, where can the line be drawn between machine and man and, and you know, projecting uh, current greed onto other, like there is so much stuff going on. That's traditional sci-fi stuff. Um, and it's it this movie does it all just really really well it takes on a lot and it yeah yeah it kind of succeeds it's so smart too um like one of the, like one of the scenes that i like really like that you know doesn't have a lot of action in it but the bathroom scene where like uh dick jones and bob like confront each other there's like that line where like uh dick is just like is it the line where he's like we used to call the old man names Boner. Yeah, it, it is. It is <laughs> I, called that, him, I called him Iron Butt. It is, but that's not the that's not the, the part boner. that like really boner. That's not the part that really stands out to me. It's like, like, you know, I had a guaranteed military sale with ED two hundred nine renovation program, spare parts for twenty five years. Who cared if it worked? Or, who cares if it works or not? Right? Like, dude, we've spent a trillion dollars on a fighter plane that doesn't work, <laughs> and well, like. That's- that's but, the other thing. There's a humanity, but I also don't know if he's a very good businessman sometimes because it's like, he's, a, you know he's, an, ex- no. he's an excellent business, yeah. business by, by 1987 yeah. standards. He is yeah. the perfect businessman. The, Cause yeah. that's, that's the thing. This the, like what this quote does is just, it points out like the, uh, agency issue with the military industrial complex where it can actually be more profitable if the thing doesn't work. Because he's just like, we're going to, like, they're going to pay us to develop it. All it has to do is, like, continually develop. And we could just keep on taking that government check and taking that government check. Which is, again, like, he didn't know it at the time. But that is exactly what, like, we're doing that, like, what, like, these military defense contractors are doing with things like the F-35 fighter plane. And it's just, it's wild. It's just wild how accurate this movie was 30 years ago. And I think and, the funny I mean, thing is about it too, you're laughing at Iron Butt and then it just drops a, a philosophical bomb on you. It's what this movie does throughout. I, I mean, there, there's little, this movie is littered with funny little things like the 6,000 SUX car. Like that's the fact that they named a car, the 6,000 sucks is so remarkably wonderful and on the nose. Um, Dick Jones falling out of the window at the end, the very end of the movie. That's the one thing that looks legit bad. That's oh, sad, yeah. With know, his like, arms. The, the weird like stretchy arms. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's strange. No, no one's going to do it. No one's going to do it as good as Hans Gruber. It was on the thumbnail of top 10 satires of all time. As it should be. Um, yeah. So, so that's... Uh, that's really, and other, otherwise, like we haven't done, I think it's gotten some, ha- some mentions in like our sci-fi list and heroes, top 10 heroes. I think I got a mention as well. Um, but then there's, uh, and I'm sure I called out Boddicker in villains. Uh, I didn't go back and check, but, um, but otherwise we, like we've covered it with, you know, we've done a handful of, of, um, you know, homemade movies and things like that. And, and then there's the the interpretive dance version of Murphy's murder that I'm intensely proud of, uh, that we did years ago. Uh, but otherwise it's not on in really many lists for us. So like, how do we fix that? What lists do we need to put into production now? Just, just as an excuse to talk about RoboCop gunslingers, gunslingers. That's a good one. I have the whole leg. Well, I was also thinking of like character transformations. Like, I don't know if we have that list, but the, from Murphy to RoboCop and even from, Emil to hunk of toxic waste. <laughs> Best Detroit movies. Best Detroit movies, sure. Detroit as a dystopia, I think is is 
this trend has been apparently a dystopian American cinema for like the last like 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Detroit. It's old Detroit. Old Detroit. New Detroit when we build it. Did, did they ever, by the way, did they ever finish that Robocop statue for Detroit? I don't know if it. Because I remember, I mean, that was 10 years ago, I think they announced that. Um, that they were going to dedicate a statue of Robocop in the middle of Detroit. Like, was it like in front of City Hall or something like that? According to Michigan Live, Detroit's massive RoboCop statue may finally see the light of day permanently. I don't, and this was from 2022. This was from last year. Okay. So I don't think it's uh, completely out yet. Still working on it. Yeah. That's good. All You know what? It's If it takes forever, it's worth it. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, shall we torf? Uh, so Peter Weller didn't fit into the police car in full costume. When he needed to be in the car, he wore the top part of the costume and sat in his underwear. True or false? Uh, I true, at minimum, at minimum, it's true about the top part of the costume. Because those legs would not fit behind a steering wheel. That's true. Uh, no, That's true. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is true. Even the me. underwear part? Even the underwear part, yeah. I know he was uh, losing a shit. I know he was losing a shitload of weight because it was like 120 degrees, like 120 degrees in that suit, and I was like, they shot, just like the sweating it off thing, all day. The hottest, <laughs> dankest part of this, like Dallas summer. Yeah. Yeah, he totally didn't need to be in his underwear though. I. <laughs> <laughs> no, that feels like a really specific flex. That's it does. Yeah, that, I was like, no, I could wear pants, but <laughs> I could wear like give me a pair of basketball shorts or something. No, 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 I'm good. I'll go with the underwear. <laughs> um, another thing is to just as a side note to this, uh, another thing Robo can't do is walk up the stairs, which is interesting because he could walk down the stairs. Uh, the suit acts strange and the butt wiggles in an odd looking way, amusing perhaps, but not what the Robo team wanted. So the scene had to be cheated. So, huh. The Robocop like sh- shaking yeah. it up up uh <laughs> up a flight of stairs. I love it. That's the cut I would like to see. <laughs> yeah. Give me the give me the, the booty shake uh cut of Robocop, please. Well, I'm gonna move on to the next one because Kahlo already knows it, but I'm gonna try to uh adjust it on the fly. This one's gonna be this one's gonna be half Often. half true. Yeah. <laughs> so Cal was right in that he was losing a lot of water weight. Uh, Peter Weller was because the robo cop suit was so hot. Give me, a, give me a guess about how many pounds a day he lost due to water four. weight. Four. I'm putting my number out. Four. Four. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Uh, Price is right. Rules with just one. Well, Cal is closest. It's three. He lost three pounds a day. Oh, no. Uh, Clint's right. Price is right rules. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Going over. Yeah. Well, I climbed the Price is right rules, but that, that was yeah. kind of a cop out. I'm happy to give that one to you. Uh, for the record, they eventually uh, installed air conditioning in the suit because that is that is brutal. <laughs> the idea, they, they finally installed air conditioning in the room. After he was <laughs> completely dehydrated, they're he like, lost right. 35 pounds. Of, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you a fan in here? <laughs> that poor guy. Um, true or false? Sylvester Stallone was briefly considered for the role of Robocop. False. False. Yeah. I, I mean, short of like him showing up on a list that they made when they, you know, when the script got bought, like, I, I think that's false. It was never a big enough budget for Stallone. You guys are correct. That is false. But yes. I, I'm sure you guys have heard of who was actually considered, right? I, I thought they were considering Arnold, but he yes. was just too jacked and he wouldn't be able to fit in a suit in a meaningful way. Yep. That's what it was. They really? thought he looked like the Michelin man. Yeah, he they didn't want. And it kind of makes sense because Peter Weller is not super jacked. He's a lean dude. No, and I think they well, were right. I mean, the fact that he's he's kind of a regular guy makes makes the movie. Like, why? Like, if he's some sort of weird Superman before he's RoboCop, like, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, we talked about star roles in the, in the Third Man episode. This is a really interesting one because it's not one that you get a lot of FaceTime with. But I think P- Peter Weller did what he needed to do here. Well, it's very... I, I also thought about Batman, about Keaton as Batman from 89 a lot in this, just because they're like... And it was during this the scene where he's walking through the house and like being struck by the amount of acting that Peter Weller was actually doing just with his mouth and chin. Like, I... Yeah. I bought his emotion in those scenes just, you know, as robot cop with just his mouth, which by the way, why did nobody ever shoot him in the mouth? 
Good it's the point. Only, it's the only part of him that's not Robo. And they just yeah. they just never shot him there. I don't get it. Real missed opportunity. Clarence. <laughs> Clarence. Get it again. Well, that would take a lot of precision, to be fair. He might have tried. Yeah, there was too much cocaine in that warehouse. Too much um, cocaine. It was, yes, not really shot in Detroit. Um, but true or false, there is not one single shot in this movie that takes place in Detroit. F- uh, fall, false. I, no, I'm just going to say Torf on this because I think that there... <laughs> um, I mean, there were there were some like second unit establishing shots. Yeah, I think that they did Detroit. Yeah, I don't think I don't think uh, Verhoeven was ever in Detroit, but there there are shots of Detroit in the film. Is what I'm saying. Is what I'm thinking. There is one. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, uh, the opening scene is a stock shot of Detroit, uh, and it is the only it's the only uh, shot in Detroit and the only stock shot in the in the film. Yeah. One more dwarf. Uh, depending on who you ask, it took anything from eight to 11 hours for Peter Weller to put on the suit for the very first time. True. That is true. That is very true. Yes. I, I also, I, I did, I read that they, that also that, um, and it's hard, it's hard prepping for these and trying to stay away from torfs because you just come across some of these random little factoids I know. Uh, all, all the time. But like, I had also read that at some point they got it down to like, Bit, like half an hour or something it started yeah. at like nine or ten hours getting the suit on but they got so good at it like halfway through production that it took like half an hour or an hour or something like that so i yeah. i just re- remember reading it's about when he how- got so skinny maybe that's what it was yeah. yeah i just remember reading about how like it took like 11 hours and then like they all he also had a mind coach to teach him how to move like a robot and then all of the stuff that they practiced totally didn't work when he tried on the costume for the first time so they had to like stop production for a couple of days so they could relearn new robotic motion so he could he could learn how to robot in in a robot in, in, costume yeah <laughs> that's great uh i know i actually uh, i lied i have one more that i okay. just didn't scroll down far enough uh true or false writer ed Neutermeyer had a re- originally pitched robocop as a comic book to stan lee before he sent the script to producer john davidson mm. i want to say true false yeah I say false it's true. Huh? Ah. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was going to be a trick question about because yeah. it became a comic book. comic book. They did comic versions of it, but I didn't I didn't think it was pitched as one first. Uh, yeah. He said, I I took Michael Miner and funny enough, uh, yeah, Stan Lee to a screening of it, a uh, screening of Terminator at Paramount. We had pitched RoboCop as a comic to Stan, hoping we could make it into a movie. After seeing the Terminator, Stan said, boys, you're never going to top that. Uh, so it never worked out as a comic book. The true influence of James Cameron's movie was that it had not been a hit for Orion, or had it not been a hit for Orion, they would have not made RoboCop. Uh, but still, the Terminator RoboCop relationship good, remains. Good, good on those folks at Orion, knowing uh, knowing how to, you know, double down, <laughs> double down on robots. Yeah, have we mentioned that that Orion did both Terminator and RoboCop? They were really no, yeah, just yeah, we yeah, just yeah. now. We, yeah, uh, they're yeah. really milking that, and if it worked, you know. Well, especially if if they wanted Schwarzenegger to to be RoboCop too, like I can imagine Schwarzenegger was like, really? Did I kind of? <laughs> I just did. That. I kind of just did this. Typecasting is one thing, but this is. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It was the bad guy, sure, but I mean, come on. Huh? Huh? <laughs> I f-ing love that guy. Who's your MVP for this movie? Seriously. Yeah, it can be a quick answer. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to... I think we can all probably agree, right? We'll do it on the count of three. We'll go one, two, three, name it. Ready? One, two, three. Verhoeven. Verhoeven. Yeah. Yeah, I really tried to think of someone else. Like, and I was thinking like, oh, could it be, could it, the script or none of the actors really stood out to me as like totally... No, it's Verhoeven. There's no other answer. I'm happy to give my, my Judd Hirsch also ran award to, uh, to Kurtwood Smith. Uh, just yeah. because of how much I love Boddicker, and I think that like that mindless jackal kind of violence uh, that he that he does, um, I mean, it sells the satire on its own way. Like if if he wasn't so around the bend with his bloodthirstiness, like I, I don't think I don't think the satire works quite as well if the if the that pack of villains isn't quite so quite so nuts. So, uh, but that's all coming from Verhoeven. So, yeah. I mean, it's a great performance, but I, the satire part of it, everything we've been talking about over and over again yeah. is just, it's, it's Verhoeven. That's kind of what makes this movie timeless. And you know, I like when I was, when I was watching this, this time around and like, I mean, we're going to, I'm going to just like 
also double in on the rebootable section. Like, is it rebootable? Sure, they tried, right? But when, like, when I was thinking about this movie relative to like the 2014 reboot, all I could think about is Doctor Strange Love and Failsafe, which I don't know. Like, I'm I don't know if you guys know, but like Doctor Strange Love and Failsafe are based off of the same source material, which is this novel that I think is called Failsafe. I think that's like the actual name of the book. Anyway, uh, whatever whatever the book is called, well, if you could Google that, that would be great. But yeah. Kubrick read that book and was just like, this is so scary that the only way you can like think about this is in, is like in an absurdist kind of like comedy. And he gives us Dr. Strangelove, which is ex like, which is just excellent satire on like the concept of mutually assured destruction. Whereas like Failsafe treats it as like a very serious, like we're going to be at the brink of war with the Russians. And it, that movie has just not aged. Well, it just doesn't have any kind of like, the real appeal of Dr. Strangelove. And I just think that like RoboCop is like the Dr. Strangelove of like, you know, Reagan era, like at Reaganomics and like corporate greed just with dick jokes, right? Like the close, like the closest that you'll get to a dick joke in Dr. Strangelove is just like, but the fluids man, Drake, where it's like, like, you know, Verhoeven is going to probably take a day of shooting just to shoot a guy in the dick which we also haven't talked about yet. And it's still one of the greatest shots in that film, which is just like when like those guys are trying to like rape that woman. And it's just like, he holds them up and then just like shoots through her dress into his dick. Like that is the kind of low brow, just like dad humor that like this movie gets so right, but can also simultaneously make, make very, very poignant observations on the military industrial complex and like how gentrification and like corporate greed are ruining our, are like are ruining our um, like society. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then those are, those are things that don't go away, which yeah. is uh, to, your, um, to answer the question before. And I, I knew it wasn't quite cause I'd, I'd done the, what's the difference on Dr. Strange love. And I knew, but that's based on a book called red alert and Failsafe is based on a book called Failsafe. Uh, so they, but more or less, I mean, it's the same, you know, Failsafe is the straight Dr. Strange, uh, yeah, Dr. Right? Strange love. So, I mean, it's the same, more or less the same story. But yeah, no, that's an interesting, that's an interesting comparison too, to, between the two remakes. Because like RoboCop as a remake felt like a remake that didn't get it. No, it did. Like, I, I feel like it, it got it. You know, I think the Total Recall is that, that remake is one that just straight up didn't get what was great about the first one. I think the RoboCop remake understood what was great about the first one. It just didn't do it as well. Like, cause there was that whole Samuel L. Jackson character, you know, that was kind of the, the media figure that was, it just wasn't, it was, it was too serious. Um, it's a real shame. Cause I think this movie is so remakeable. Like you could do it every, every couple of decades. Well, with that's just, that's different themes. That's the danger, right? It's just like the, it's, it's forever relevant. Um, but also like, because it's so relevant forever, like number one, it stays around, like just the original sticks around, but number two, like it, it tricks you into thinking that it's ripe for a reboot because it's still relevant. Like it still makes total sense. But I mean, like I, you know, the total, we don't recall, need to do it again. I don't think the total reboot, the total recall reboot also suffers, suffers from the f same thing, right? Which is like, they forget to have like the Verhoeven sarcasm. And then people sit there and wonder like, why doesn't this thing work? It's like, oh, yeah, because it's like Paul Verhoeven could like not only do the action, but he could also just do this subversive humor that is just so uniquely him and such a larger part of the DNA than more people than most people realize. This is for you. Oh. Happy New Year. So we're we're running short on time, so let's hustle into Calibro, our last segment here, please. So if Nicholas if this movie was to be remade with Nicholas Cage, who does Nicholas Cage play? Easy. Dick Jones. Dick Jones. That's, that was that's, nine. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, it's okay. such an obvious answer. Yeah. It's obviously unanimous Jake. choice. <laughs> I feel like there's part of me that would like to see him as Boddicker, uh, or as as uh, Miguel Ferrer's character as as Morton. Um, you know, one of those sort of younger, angrier, kind of louder villains. 
But to see him just kind of like quietly stew and rein it in a little bit as as a more sort of an older and more controlled evil corporate guy like Dick Jones, that would that would be great. Well, that's why it's well, that's why it's Dick Jones and not Bob. Because I I toyed with that too. I toyed with it. No, it has to be that older, seasoned, very evil. Yeah, no, he'd yeah. be great. At Dick. Very very also, quietly threatening. Yeah, I thought about him as Murphy too. That didn't work. No, it's it's Dick Jones. No. It's either Dick Jones or it's the uh, I'd buy that for a dollar guy. But that part's too small. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's both. Dick Jones, Division President, OCP. Every policeman knows when he joins the force that there are certain inherent risks that come with the territory. Ask any cop, he'll tell you. If you can't stand the heat, you better stay out of the kitchen. Well, let's talk about where this movie ranks. Where where did you guys have it? Cal, where's it on your list? 38. 38. Okay. Yeah. Top is, half. This is this is a classic for me. It's top half. Uh, Alex? Not on, on my list. list. No. Not on your list I, at all. I... I Again, probably spoiled it by my introduction to it, but I still I, I appreciate it. It's just not in my it's not in Alex Stedman's top of hundo. And after revisiting it and talking about it as much as we have, still 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 yeah. outside your top one hundred. Uh, yeah, and you okay. know I've gone I've gone back on some of the movies like Third Man. I actually may want to put in my top hundred, but right. RoboCop I think it can it, it has enough help uh, help from you guys. I think it can stay out of my hundred. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't need yours. <laughs> but I liked um, it more. I liked visiting it more than I thought I would. So I'll say that. This is one for me that I was surprised at, at how low I had. I had it in seventy nine, which feels uh, lower than how I've talked about it this whole time. Certainly, like, I can't believe I'm buying t-shirts for a 79th best movie of all time. You know, it feels like it ought to be higher. Um, Dan, I'm told, had it at 13. So that's, yes. that's, a, Dan, that's a... Dan knows what's up. I'm enjoying learning Dan's taste. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I just like when it... Going. <laughs> I just like when it doesn't align exactly with mine. Um, I just want to... I am glad. I, 13 might be more where I should have, where I feel like I should have ranked this movie in terms of how much I like it, but uh, but 79 for some reason. Who knows? Um, so, Cal, you've got the envelope there. Where's this? Let's figure out how the algorithm works. At some point, we should attempt to crack the algorithm. No, we shouldn't do that. That's silly. No. Where is Dan will just, Dan will just change what the is, algorithm and then we have to just start all over again. Yeah, he'll go full YouTube on us. Um, I'm convinced he just made up the list anyway. Uh, yeah, there is no he algorithm. Copied, he just copied yeah. mine. Um, okay, so seventy nine. How, in, how many Independence Day t shirts do you own? <laughs> None. It's bizarre. Um, although I do still have the the little uh, what is it called lenticular thing where you, when you move it the image changes. The the one that came with the VHS copy of it. Oh, oh, those like I do in, still have that here in my office. I can I'll have to take my headphones off to grab it, but I'll show it to you later. Anyway, All right. so where's this rank? This so the Cinefix Top 100 episode. This is number 22. Number 22. That's the price. 79. Thanks to 79, 39. 38, 13, and not on the top 100 gets you to number 22. 22. Number 22. Okay. I Actually, thought that, it was going to be higher or lower or bigger number. The <laughs> bigger number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 22. Um, you know what? 22. I, I don't mind it. I, I'm not going to complain about that. That's no. Bad. That's pretty high. It's not top I mean, 20, but also, it's damn close. Also, yeah, no, that's that's up there. That's really up there. Um, and also, considering that I'm sitting here thinking that I should have had it ranked more in that neighborhood anyway, like this could have been a top 10, I guess, uh, if I'd have done that. I was yeah. trying to get it into my top 20, but I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get it in there. So you couldn't it's... find 18 movies to displace to get it in your top 20? No. I was no, going to say, it wasn't that close to your top 20. It's <laughs> 10 so like, yeah, yeah, It's yeah. 18 below. I mean, Wait, it's listen, like I twice did, as many. I, I did them by like chunks, all right? You do the first 20 and then everything kind of shuffles back. Then you try and do like 20 to 40 and you're like, yeah. One of these days we need to, we need to have a real talk about how we crafted our own lists. Um, but uh, we don't have time for that today, unfortunately. For now, we just have to sign off. Thank you guys for talking about RoboCop and letting me wear my t-shirt, not making fun of me too much about it. Um, so thanks for watching that. Uh, and also, thank you to our producer, Tayo Oyekin. Thank you to Marian Franzen, our technical producer, and for Jamie Parslow for making us look good. And Cal, Alex, thank you also... I guess just go straight to hell, Dan. 
Um, bitches leave. Just bitches leave. <laughs> is that how we should tell our audience to, to click yes. to something else now? Bitches leave. Bitches leave. <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Next week, we are going to get into some equally goopy stuff when we watch The Exorcist. So come back for that. Come back for that.